Hello, and thank you for joining us today for the second lecture in CHOP's Clinical Advances in Pediatric Oncology Seminar Series. We are so excited by the enthusiasm and the number of individuals who have registered for today's seminar, and as well as the upcoming other lectures in this series. We believe that this webinar series is a new way for us to connect with you, our regional, national, and international professional partners and colleagues. I am delighted to introduce today's lecture, which will be provided by two renowned experts from the CHOP Cancer Center, Dr. Stephen Grupp and Dr. Richard Eplins. Three years after FDA approval of the first CAR T-cell therapy, today's lecture will review outcomes data since the start of this groundbreaking therapy and provide an update on advancements and new trials in the field of cancer immunotherapy. Today's lecture is being recorded and a copy of the rec recording will be shared with all registrants. Also, we have left significant time at the end of today's lecture for a question and answer session. Please don't be shy. We encourage you to post your questions throughout the lecture using the Q&A button in the webinar portal. With that, allow me to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Stephen Grupp, MD, PhD, is the Chief of the Cellular Therapy and Transplant Section. Director of the Cancer Immunotherapy Program and Medical Director of the Cell and Gene Therapy Lab at CHAP, as well as the Novotny Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine. Dr. Grupp came to CHAP in 1996 after training in Boston. His primary area of research is the use of CAR T and other engineered cell therapies in pediatric cancers and other life threatening disorders such as sickle cell disease. He led all of the pediatric ALL trials of CTL-019, now approved as Kimraya. As a result of his work, he presented the clinical perspective at the first FDA ODAC CAR meeting. Dr. Grupp was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2019. Dr. Applins is the Chief Clinical Research Officer and the Section Chief for Hematologic Malignancies in the Division of Oncology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Dr. Applin's research focus is in pediatric acute myeloid leukemia, also known as AML. He currently co-chairs a multi-site CD33-directed chimeric antigen receptor CAR trial for children with relapsed and refractory AML, and leads a local CD123 CAR trial for children with relapsed and refractory AML. He also serves as the vice chair of the Children's Oncology Group AML Strategy Committee, Dr. Applins is a professor of pediatrics in the Department of Pediatrics with a secondary appointment in the Department of Biostatistics, Informatics, and Epidemiology. Please join me first in welcoming Dr. Grupp. All right. Welcome, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about this. Um, so can everybody see my slides? We cool with that? We can see them. Excellent. Thank you very much. So um, um, over the next 40 minutes or so, uh, I want to give a little whirlwind tour about uh, CAR-T, um, give you some uh, emerging data from uh, studies here at CHOP, uh, but mostly talk about development and some practical issues. Um, I'm largely going to take uh, the um, point of view of the referring physician, but um, also give you a sense for what it's like to do this um, um, at your center, uh, if you're a center that's actually doing uh, Kimraya, of course, you already know how this works, but uh, we'll just give you um, kind of how we got to where we are right now. So that's my goal for today. Um, eight years ago, we uh, treated our first, actually eight and a half now, our first pediatric patient, and this is what we've learned since then. Um, the disclosures are as listed. What The only thing that's relevant on here is that I do receive research support from Novartis and I consult for them as well. And Novartis is the drug company that brought uh, Tisogen Leclucel or CTL019 to market. So just a, a uh, level setting slide. Uh, apologies if you're very familiar with the, uh, the way the chimeric antigen receptors work, but this is just a picture of a leukemia cell on the top and a T cell on the bottom. And what you see, and I hope you can see my pointer, but I'll describe it anyway, is a target. Um, it has to be a surface target. Cars recognize surface targets with bits of antibody. And the bit of antibody is the SCFV that you see in blue and green. And um, that is actually what drives the interaction between a genetically engineered T cell and a uh, cancer cell. 
It's important to recognize that anything that's CD19 positive, our cars will see. And that means that uh, there is a, uh, an equal chance of killing off uh, leukemia, which is our goal, and normal B cells, which is uh, a side effect, but happens in all patients. Um, below that, in the, uh, inside the cell, you have all the parts of the uh, T cell activation machinery. There's uh, the initial T cell activation signal, which, which is called signal one, is uh, delivered by a part of the CD3 zeta molecule. And then the licensing and co-stimulatory signal, which is signal two, uh, which is very important to full T cell activation, is either provided by CD28 in cars that are manufactured by other folks, or 41BB, which is the co-stimulatory domain that we used initially at the University of Pennsylvania, and which is now in the product uh, that was brought to market by Novartis. This has been what Carl June likes to call a 20-year overnight sensation. Um, the actual idea of a putting together a molecule that could do all the initial functions of T cell activation and uh, then drive some interaction with another target was you know, using synthetic biology to actually activate T cells and get a T cell response was in, introduced in the late 80s, early 90s. Wasn't even called a car back then initially. But these are uh, the idea that's led to what is now uh, a number of different therapeutics that are based on this chimeric antigen receptor con concept. However, it's important to understand that for years after these initial seminal papers, which described the concept, people tried uh, these various concepts in clinical trials and saw no particular toxicity and no efficacy and not much evidence that the T cells were actually growing in the patient. So this was a while before we actually got this to work, and I'll tell you what was involved in that. Now, the, the process that we use right now, uh, this is an autologous immunocellular pro, uh, therapy, which means that we're making cells for each patient. Each patient is an entire batch in a sense of a pharmaceutical manufacturing process and has to be fully release tested before it can go to the patient. So instead of making a thousand grams of ceftazidime, putting it in a, a refrigerator or a freezer or a, a shelf somewhere and giving each patient a vial. You have to do this whole process with qualification for each individual patient. And the thought that we're able to do that at scale globally and with a, a FDA approved product uh, would have come to a huge, come as a huge surprise to all of us who were working in the field uh, seven or eight years ago. The process is we collect uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells using apheresis. It's usually a single collection. We then expose those cells to a virus. Now, the approach that we use for this particular product is a lentiviral vector, which is to say that was um, actually uh, cr um, created from the HIV virus. All of the parts of the virus that can cause disease are gone. They're out. Those, the genetic code is not there anymore. So the only thing that the vector can do is modify the T cell genome and put in that CAR gene. So there's no risk of disease. Then the T cell is genetically modified in the genome, which is a key thing. So all of us have been hearing about these mRNA vaccines and those mRNA are evanescent molecules that are in the cell for a period of time. And then once they're done, they're gone and there's no permanent genetic modification of the muscle cells where you actually get your shot. Uh, when we finally get our shots. And uh, by, by distinction, the approach that we use here is a permanent genetic medic modification. And that means that every T cell that's derived from this initial modified T cell also has the genetic modification. This drives the expression of the protein, the CAR protein on the cell surface, as you can see here. And then there's an interaction between the T cell and what's below, which is the ALL cell. We're hoping for several things to happen. Obviously, we want the uh, ALL cell to die. That's very important. We also want the uh, T cell to become activated and then proliferate. So what we found is that the proliferation of the cells is required for response. So that has led in our trials to 90% or higher complete response rates. And that is a very powerful thing to get a, a uh, refractory patient into remission. However, we also want this to be a lasting effect. We're hoping that uh, uh, somewhere around half the patients can have um, more prolonged, if not um, permanent uh, control of their disease. 
the first patient we ever treated uh, eight years ago remains in remission eight years later without further therapy, and that's the outcome we hope for many of our patients, but we know we won't get it at all. And we try to avoid bone marrow transplant, which I'll get into later, which is kind of heresy if you are, as I am, a lifelong bone marrow transplant who actually runs the bone marrow transplant program at CHOP, but we're still looking for ways to uh, supplant bone marrow transplant with something that may be less risky and or more effective. Persistence is what allows all of this. In other words, the T cells remaining in the body and functional. And the length of persistence that we need is unclear, uh, but we have data that suggests that about six months of persistence is probably what we're looking for. I wouldn't regard that as uh, hard and fast, but it's the, the operational rule that we, oper that we actually function on. I won't get into this in a lot of detail, but the reason this stuff started working somewhere in the late 2000s, 2009, 2010, is the appropriate cell manufacturing developed by Carl June and especially Bruce Levine at the University of Pennsylvania using a bead-based approach. So what you see here are these little ping, yellow ping pong balls, which are next to these uh, T cells, and the, 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 these beads provide CD3 and CD28 signaling, signal one and signal two, to these T cells, allowing them to activate without losing their ability to proliferate even further when they're given to the patient, which is key. And that characteristic of being able to proliferate and then remain is uh, associated with T cell memory and having younger, uh, phenotypically younger T cells in the uh, actual therapeutic mix. And this approach to uh, creating these cells in the lab, uh, this GMP manufacturing approach is really what allows that. So this is just evidence for proliferation. Um, this is CAR, uh, detection of CAR T cells by flow cytometry. And what you see in these graphs are, these are all T cells, all the black dots are T cells, they're CD3 positive. And then we look in the red box for those uh, T cells that are also CAR positive. And we see in the first day, the cells are somewhere else than in the, the blood, and we see none of them. And then uh, two or three weeks later, those cells have proliferated very significantly, a thousand to ten thousand fold, and those cells are now in the peripheral blood. Um, our sense is from animal studies and watching this with bioluminescent imaging that what happens is the cells are infused, some of them stick in the lungs for a short period of time and then leave. They go to the tissues where the uh, targets actually are. They proliferate within the tissues, the bone marrow. Um, if there's leukemia in the blood there too. Uh, Extramedullary sites, the CNS, we'll get into that. And then they start to spill back out into the blood and that's when we can detect them. And at this point, you can see that two thirds of the patient cells are CAR T cells. So that's pretty powerful proliferation and a long-term therapeutic effect in somewhere around half our patients, maybe a little bit less. So that's what we're actually looking for. The other point that I'll make is that as we kill abnormal B cells, we're also killing normal B cells. And so the absence of normal B cells is a clear indicator that the CAR T cells are still in the body and still doing their thing, even if they're at a, le a level where we can't detect them by flow anymore. So this is just what this looks like. Uh, so what we're looking at here, the two green cells are ALL cells. The gray cell on the bottom is a T cell, genetically modified to express a CAR, just from a volunteer. And typically a T cell would not pay any attention to these ALL cells. They're not something the T cell is actually directed toward. But by putting the CAR in, we force this interaction. The T cell goes, it connects to the ALL cell, and then you see this bubbling. And the bubbling is the destruction of the cell membrane. Uh, and the key point about this is that it doesn't matter from a therapeutic point of view that this patient is multiple relapsed or that they have unfavorable cytogenetics or that they're post-transplant. None of those things seem to particularly matter. Uh, it just is an immunologic attack on the ALL cell that ignores all the other ways that ALL uses to avoid uh, uh, being killed by whatever therapies we've been using up to that point. So you can absolutely treat uh, patients with refractory disease successfully. So this starts getting really rolling at the University of Pennsylvania in uh, 2011 when David Porter and Carl June exp uh, explain, sorry, present data from the first three patients who were treated with this, this therapy initially called CART-19, then called CTL-019. And these patients had CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, something we as pediatricians never see. And two of these patients went into remission and actually remain in remission to this day. So that was the first indication that this might actually work. Fortunately, the IRB, after three patients, was willing to allow us to initiate a study in ALL, 
um, at CHOP. And so this is the first treatment of ALL patients uh, at CHOP. And this was published, this happened in 2012 and was published in 2013 after being presented at the ASH meeting at the end of 2012. And this was a couple patients with a highly refractory ALL that underwent CAR T cell therapy, both of them placed into a remission, one of whom remains in remission, and one of whom subsequently relapsed as a result of loss of that CD19 target, which I will talk about later. And that's really, when we run into lack of efficacy in this situation, that's probably the most important cause, which is the ALL cell learning how to hide the single target that our CAR T cells go after, which is CD19. Then, um, about 18 months later, we published a paper um, describing the fact that in both adults and kids, there was a 90% co complete uh, response rate, even in patients with refractory disease, and sustained remission. So the key difference between the first paper and the second paper is we had follow-up on these patients, a number of whom had not been transplanted, and were showing a sustained remission, showing that these, this was not just a temporary effect, but could last for longer. We were nowhere near to the point of calling any of these patients potentially cured, but we did see prolonged disease-free intervals in these patients. Then in 2017, the focus uh, uh, goes over to lymphoma as well. And there are two major studies, Steve Schuster and the group at Penn using the same CTL019 product to treat lymphoma patients, uh, specifically diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And then the group that uh, working with the drug company Kite uh, eventually sold the Gilead um, uh, product that's going to that's called Axicel or now FDA approved as Yescarta, and also showing very powerful uh, control of uh, lymphoma. The data, without going into it, were characterized by somewhat lower but still very impressive CR rates and excellent maintenance of CR if the patient did go into CR with less of a problem, not zero, but less of CD19 escape. Then in 2018, the, uh, we, we, I'll talk to you about the registration trial for Tisogen Leclucel, uh, the generic name for this product, um, that was actually sponsored by Novartis, the drug company that licensed this product. This was an international trial and the registration trial for this published in 2018 after FDA approval. So let me just talk about this and if you guys have been through this it'll, it'll be a little bit of review but i think there's some rules that are worth talking about and might be helpful to folks so this is a multi-step process and it's not typical for what we do at all and also i want to i'll make this point several times it's not transplant so we're not trying to get a patient into a deep remission so they can go off to transplant and we'll do anything we can with intensive chemotherapy to get them into that deep remission that's not the goal so the steps are that we assess the patient, whether they could be a CAR T cell candidate. In a simple way, the way I, I, I think about this is that if this is the kind of patient that could tolerate autologous, not allogeneic transplant, which is a lower uh, bar, uh, but could tolerate an autologous transplant, like you would imagine them to be a Hodgkin patient who would get an auto transplant, that degree of organ function and um, uh, performance status is, is probably perfectly fine for the CAR T cell approach. We collect the cells by leukapheresis. Now, I want to really make a point here. Uh, it's this, the nice thing about this is we, we freeze the cells after we collect them. And so we can collect the cells months ahead of time and we can preserve this as a treatment option for patients who we may not be certain need that approach right then and there, but may need it in the future or may head straight to that uh, treatment. So we've, we've collected cells in many months ahead of uh, treatment, in a, a, a small number of cases, even more than a year or two ahead of treatment, so that those cells are in the freezer and ready for manufacturing when the patient needs them. But if we're moving ahead with CAR T cell therapy, then we go to the next steps. But let's just talk a little bit about collecting the appropriate cells. And if you're working with us on this uh, and you're collecting cells for your own center uh, or for, uh, for uh, set shipping to us or to Novartis, uh, there are certain rules. Uh, we want an absolute lymphocyte count around 500. That's probably the lowest to where you can realistically ca collect a pretty good product. And it's nice to have 40% of those cells be CD3 cells, so a CD3 count of 150. Um, obviously, if you have a higher lymphocyte count, then you can tolerate a lower CD3 count. Typically, this is a one-day collection. If they have very poor cells collected, going a second or a third day probably isn't going to change that very much. 
So I don't see a reason to add a second day of collection unless there was a problem with the uh, phoresis line on the first day. For those of you who do phoresis, this is a minimum two to three volume, but we've done four or five and occasionally even more volumes with low cell counts where we think we're gonna have trouble getting enough cells. Much better to go longer on the machine than to come back the next day from my perspective. <clears throat> Patients have to be off chemotherapy. We want to collect T cells and we want to collect T cells that are healthy. So uh, 72 hours for steroids, a week for most chemotherapy. Uh, try to get them off their, their uh, replacement hydrocortisone, at least for the actual moment of collection, which is, is, is feasible to do in essentially all patients. No patient is going to get Addisonian in 24, 48 hours. Uh, we try to avoid clofarabine because it's so incredibly immunosuppressive. Uh, Pegasparaginase can have a significant um, T cell effect for weeks, and so we try not to do that immediately before collection. Interestingly, um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, especially dasatinib, can cause significant T cell dysfunction. You don't want to be on it when you actually collect the cells. And if they are post-transplant and had GVHD, they need to be not having active GVHD and off GVHD meds other than topicals. Now. We've collected the patient, we're getting them ready for CAR-T, we're manufacturing the CAR-T either at the University of Pennsylvania, at your own center, or most typically at Novartis. <clears throat> now we want to bridge the patient to the therapy, and that may be three or four weeks, typically it takes 22 days to make the cells. The key here is intensive the chemotherapy to get the patient into an MRD remission, MRD negative remission is not our goal. We want minimal, uh, you know, uh, maintenance style or uh, intermediate dose IV-based chemotherapy just to keep the disease under, the contr under control. If you send us a patient for transplant and they have 10% blasts, they're not eligible. It's a catastrophe and we can't treat them. You send us a patient with 10% blasts for CAR-T, we're delighted. Perfect. Great. Right in the sweet spot. A lower risk of uh, toxicity and you haven't given them intensive chemotherapy that may cause uh, infections that make them lose their eligibility for, for uh, CAR-T therapy. There are reasons which are technical and I can get into if people are interested in this in the question and answer period, not to use blinatumumab, which is targeted at CD19, but also if we can, avoiding inatuzumab, which is targeted at CD22, and we can talk about why that is. It's not absolute, it's not an absolute contraindication. We've uh, collected patients after both, We've treated patients successfully after both, but we'd like to avoid it if we can. I've talked about CD19, it's a target on all ALL, but uh, if they have a CD19 negative population, which is really only in the group of patients who've gotten CD19 directed therapy like blinatumumab, if it's obvious that they have CD19 negative disease, then that's a contraindication for treatment, but it's actually fairly hard to ascertain that. Dim is not a problem. A spread from possibly negative to bright is not a problem. It's really two separate populations where one is uh, positive and the other one is clearly negative. That's where we uh, are hesitant to treat that patient because we think they're just gonna relapse with CD19 negative disease. And then after we treat them, the goal is to do nothing. We don't want to give them chemo. We don't want to give them vincristine. We don't want to give them intrathecal therapy. We don't want them back on their TKI. We, all, we try to avoid steroids as much as we can unless there's a really good reason to give them and for as short a time as possible. We really want to just have the CAR T cells that have the opportunity to work. Patient selection, I won't get into this in a lot of detail. Active infections, no. Controlled infections are fine. That's the bottom line. Um, <clears throat> A key question that I'm often asked, is it worth more chemo to decrease the blast percentage before they actually go into CAR-T? If you need to do that, they're refractory, and probably the best move is to get them into CAR-T as quickly as possible while they're still in good shape. There, the situations when we don't treat patients, which are very rare, is an uncontrolled infection that we have to get under control, or if a patient's blast count is rising so fast, they have a white count of 100,000 that we just think that not only are they refractory, but exponentially increasing disease burden, we might not consider treating that patient. Briefly presenting the data from the pivotal phase two trial. So this was <coughs> the international uh, trial uh, sponsored by Novartis. I uh, had the privilege of running the uh, study steering committee um, and CHOP was a site on the trial, but this is 25 centers in 11 countries. 
the ma vast majority of which had not treated a CAR-T patient before, but they're awesome centers with awesome docs. We worked very closely together, um, all teaching each other best practices as we stood up this brand new field of medicine in a collaborative fashion. It was an amazing experience. And th uh, this was Canada and the US, but also the EU and Japan and Australia. So we were able to ship cells logistically across oceans and get them back for the pur purpose of CAR-T therapy. These are the data very quickly again. Um, the, <clears throat> pardon me, the uh, complete response rate, either CR or incomplete CR, 82% on this multi-institution study. Of those patients who were CR, uh, in a CR, 98% are MRD negative by multi-parameter flow, and I'll show you a little more data on that in a moment. The, then the next question is, if you go into remission, if you don't go into remission, then that's a bad sign, but most patients do, the vast majority. But if you go into remission, then how likely you are to keep that remission? That's what this curve shows. And so a uh, year out, two-thirds of the patients still in remission. 24 months out, 62% of the patients still in remission. And we should be providing updated, updated data from these, this study fairly soon. So, and then the overall survival, 76% at 12 months and 66% at 24 months. So it doesn't differ too much from the relapse-free survival. Now, this is a, a, a technical point, but it may be something we're all doing in a year or two. So we all send our, our uh, MRD to, we actually, during the study, sent it to the University of Washington. And then also uh, there was another central lab that did this. But there's a, a, a more sensitive technique, which is next generation sequencing or high throughput sequencing uh, that is now, it's, it's available from a company called Adaptive and is probably one and a half to logs minimum better, maybe two logs better than flow. And so what we did is we took a, a group of patients who were in remission and MRD negative by flow and then did this other test, which was more sensitive, and then separated those patients into positive and negative. And you can see that patients who were positive on the blue curve at a 20% EFS or uh, duration of remission, uh, likelihood of remission uh, duration. And then the patients in green that were negative, 80%. And I think that if we can validate these data and we should be publishing on this soon, that that, that would suggest that uh, the patients on the blue curve should go to transplant. They're still in remission. They just have this very low level disease that we haven't cleared with the car. And the patients on the green curve should, when they're allowed to again, go to school. So we hope that's true. Uh, we hope this green curve is really the group uh, that we're really gonna focus on not transplanting in the future. But I think there's, we wanna get the, this data out in a paper, have it peer reviewed and available to all of you to evaluate and then see if this is actually what the uh, recommendation is gonna be. I'm gonna spend some time on toxicity. So uh, there are substantial toxicities from CAR-T therapy as all of you know, and cytokine release syndrome is the big one. Um, for the other therapy available, which is uh, called Yes Carter AxiCell, neurologic events are a really significant problem, but in this study and in our ex clinical experience, neurologic events are not the problem, and the feared neurologic event of cerebral edema was not seen on this study. So let me just make sure it doesn't reboot my computer. Um, so the issue is uh, cytokine release syndrome, and uh, it's, it's so grade three cytokine release syndrome, a lot of these patients, basically all of, close to all of them are in the ICU. Grade four, they're all in the ICU. And almost half the patients have grade three or grade four. So it's a significant toxicity. But I would also say that in the real world experience with this, with Tisogen Leclucel, with uh, uh, Kim Raya, the real world experience is quite different. You would expect it to be worse, uh, but it wasn't. It was much better. And so the uh, our ICU admission rate, just as one center, has gone from uh, 40% ICU admission rate and some very nice uh, analysis that was done by Regina Myers and Shannon Maud to uh, uh, 12, 13% uh, uh, three, four years later. So that's dropped considerably, better management and probably earlier referral. The best thing you can do to improve the outcome for CAR-T patients is to refer them early and not spend a great deal of time trying to bang them into remission for a bone marrow transplant. I think we can accomplish a lot of what you need. And even if your goal is transplant, CAR-T is a great way to get there if that's what you wanna do. So this 
all of this development, the initial CHOP study, the first U.S. multi-site trial, and then the Novartis registration trial, all led to the first uh, BLA submission for a CAR-T product and uh, an ODAC meeting in July of 2017 and then FDA approval August 30, 2017. The first uh, gene therapy in the United States, the first CAR-T therapy anywhere uh, approved for children with and young adults with uh, ALL. And so that it's something that we as a group take a great deal of pride in because there's not much there where there's an adult and a pediatric indication where it gets approved in peds first. So we're pretty excited about that outcome. And it was very clear in the discussion um, at the ODAC, the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee, that the FDA really wanted to know about safety. They were like, we believe that this works. We understand the efficacy argument, but show us that you can actually do this safely. And having a broad international trial, I think was very convincing in the sense that these patients can get quite ill, can go to the ICU, but can be successfully managed. <clears throat> I want to briefly comment on uh, uh, an issue that I'd said I would say something about, which is, <coughs> pardon me, um, CNS disease. So obviously CNS is a, har a harbor site for ALL and CNS relapse is a significant problem when it happens. So we looked at the outcome in patients who had a larger group of patients that had prior CNS3 disease and uh, other patients that actually had active CNS disease when they went to, to, trans, to uh, uh, CAR-T. Um, and what we're really seeing is that uh, even the patients who had CNS2 or CNS3 disease, and all of these data are being updated right now, they all go into remission. Even with CNS disease, CNS3 disease, even with abnormal MRIs, even with parenchymal disease, we're able to control the disease with CAR-T because these cells do go to the, to the spinal fluid and presumptively to the brain. Uh, a little harder to prove that without biopsying anything, and we're not doing that. Less than 3% of our patients have experienced a CNS relapse. That also suggests that there's decent surveillance. I, I just very recently, a couple weeks ago, saw a patient with Philadelphia positive disease who had had six prior CNS relapses before he came to us. He uh, got CAR-T and is now in uh, complete response. Actually, I got to update this slide six years later, not four years later. So clearly we can provide some benefit for people with uh, CNS disease. When we look, we see these cells in the CSF in spinal taps 98% uh, of the time and at high levels. Now let's talk about relapse is our problem. The, uh, there are two mechanisms of relapse. One is the cells remain CD19 positive, and that is an indication that the T cells didn't last long enough to get every last ALL cell. And that's where this six month uh, persistence notion comes from. But our big problem is CD19 negative uh, relapse where the cars are perfectly functional, although they're still in the patient, they're still in persistent, the patient still has B cell aplasia, but now the uh, CD19 negative ALL is not recognized by the car. And there are a variety of ways to potentially deal with this, but probably the most straightforward is to combine a CART-22, which we have access to, and CART-19 or ctl 19 in a hope of eliminating that small number of cells that are CD19 negative um, that either develop in the patient or were always there. Uh, so that combination therapy will be tested at CHOP um, in the next two, three months. And we also are in a position to know that there's data from other centers where they're trying the same thing. So I think that uh, what we hope is that we can get a longer term EFS curve that's uh, uh, not 40 to 50%, but is more like 80% if we can avoid CD19 escape. Now, more about toxicity, cytokine release syndrome. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Uh, these slides are available to anybody who wants them if they're interested in this, but it happens um, typically a few days after uh, cell infusion. It can be a little later than that but typically it's, it's, it's within the first week for sure. It says one to 14 days, but, but those are later events, which are, may not even be CRS. There's a clinical spectrum, uh, anywhere from fevers and myalgias, the patients are in the hospital, high spiking fevers, up to 40, 41 degrees, miserable, but completely clinically stable for about a week. Um, or we have a group of patients now about 12% of our patients that need ICU level care for hypotension, that's our big concern, respiratory insufficiency, ARDS, occasionally renal insufficiency, and often coagulopathy. These are all things that we have to watch out for. But what gets you up to the ICU more often than not is unstable hypotension. And this is absolutely a little bit of disease. This doesn't happen at all. 
if you have 80% blast, there's an excellent chance you still are going to go to the ICU. <clears throat> this is a technical point. I'm not going to spend any time on it, but these patients have enormously elevated ferritin, sometimes in the hundreds of thousands, and this clearly indicates that the patients have a macrophage activation syndrome. And in this yes-no analysis, which is essentially is, did you go to the ICU or not, the patients who went have a hundredfold higher ferritin. And then a key observation is that these patients have a hundredfold higher inter interferon gamma, as we expect as a it's, uh, effector cytokine with the T cells really moving to kill all this ALL. That's a hundredfold higher, but also a hundredfold higher interleukin-6, which nobody in the world would have guessed before we actually uh, observed that in our first pediatric patient that we traded eight and a half years ago. Uh, made that observation, she had life-threatening CRS, reversed it with a drug that blocks IL-6, it actually blocks the IL-6 receptor, tocilizumab or TOSI. And this has been a very effective drug uh, for management of uh, CRS. It already has a pediatric indication and a pediatric dose, and that was extremely uh, useful for us in giving it to this first patient off-label, which our pharmacy doesn't like. Uh, we do it all the time with, of course, cancer chemotherapeutics, but this was a non-chemo uh, drug. And uh, it's usually extremely well tolerated, and it now actually is the only indicated therapy for the treatment of CRS. And uh, the data have gone back and forth, whether it's helpful in the CRS that's associated with uh, COVID-19. This is often what we see, not every time by any means. High spiking fever, sustained high fever, starts to get uh, a soft blood pressure. We give tocilizumab, and then everything shuts off very quickly within hours after that. It's not universally the case. And there's a whole stepwise approach that we use to treating CRS. The slides are in here. You can look at them. The, uh, this is the evidence for disease burden. And again, this is BLAST percentage as one way of measuring disease burden. And you can see that uh, patients with severe CRS are all above 50% BLAST. And the only three patients above 50% BLAST who did not get severe CRS, two patients who didn't respond, there were three in this study who didn't respond, everybody else did, and one very lucky patient with 70% BLAST who did not go to the ICU. This is a stepwise approach. I'm not going to go through this. The slides are, are available. If one is, people want to see the slides, I'm happy to share them. Um, we start with tocilizumab. We, if we give steroids, we give steroids very, very briefly. We try to get them off the steroids as quickly as possible. We can give the tocilizumab again. And then if we're still uh, having a sick patient, which is a very small fraction of the patients, but they are quite ill and need an outstanding intensive care unit to, to manage these patients. You know, we treat these patients in the outpatient setting. We infuse them in the clinic. We give them their chemo, uh, LD chemo in the clinic. We give them their cells in the clinic. I just did that today. But then if they're admitted to the hospital for fever, that's when we were watching whether they might get sick or not. And if they get hypotension, they go to the ICU and they follow this management pathway. And so at this point in time, number one, number one very surprising to people that we treat patients in the outpatient setting. We've done that since the beginning. And number two, half the patients that we treat now are not getting admitted to the hospital because they don't develop a fever. And that's usually the first, not usually by definition now, the first step on CR, uh, for uh, CRS. There are other choices on this uh, slide. I'm not gonna go through it. We did a trial asking whether uh, earlier treatment is better. The short answer is that it is. We've, we've chose patients with high disease burden and sustained fever and gave them a dose of tocilizumab right away. We reduced the number of patients who had grade four CRS, but we did not prevent grade four CRS. And I think it's fair to say that even though lower CRS rates are great, uh, the patients who really got, had grade four, even despite this early tocilizumab, weren't any less sick than our typical grade four patients. Key points here, no impact on CR rate, no impact on the expansion of the CAR T cells, that was really a question. No impact on CAR persistence, that was even a bigger question. And then coming us to us from the Yes Carta people, uh, no impact on ICANs, which is the new uh, uh, category of uh, neurotoxicity. Um, speaking of CRS and neurotoxicity, there's now consensus grading that we encourage everyone to use from the ASTCT that were published uh, uh, a little over a year ago now. Um, I think we know a lot about cytokine release syndrome. Uh, we know how to treat it at least most of the time, but for neurotoxicity, we're lucky we don't see as much of it because we really don't know as much mechanistically at all. So we need to know more about that. 
where what, what we see is delirium, confusion, encephalopathy, and occasionally in seizures in patients who've had a prior seizure history, almost always. It, it resolves on its own. We don't do anything. We don't give the patient steroids, almost uh, without exception, in, in rarely, but yes, uh, but almost never. And no cerebral edema, which was the big concern for CD28 type cars. This is a 41BB type car. There's also a grading scale for um, neurotoxicity, otherwise known as ICANs, for both adults and pediatrics. All right, I want to briefly make this point, I'm getting close to the end of my time. 80, uh, who goes to transplant at CHOP? Well, a lot of our patients don't. So patients generally come to us because we want to work with them. I just saw a patient this afternoon, a uh, three-year-old Down syndrome patient, refractory uh, disease, low-level disease, referred early, got a cell therapy product, did not have CRS, did very well, uh, now in remission for the first time. Um, and the goal for that patient is try to avoid transplant if we can. So I'm not guaranteeing that we can, but that was the goal. That still is the goal. So who does go to transplant? Well, if a patient was referred to us by a center who wants to transplant them and says, please get them in remission, that's cool. We do it. Uh, those patients, if they're close to have lower disease burden, have an ex, I mean, uh, even close to 100% remission induction rate. So that's a great way to get somebody in remission and it doesn't make them sick at all. So it's in, those patients are in awesome shape if you want to do transplant, which I'm trying to avoid. If they are MRD positive, then I think we need to think about whether we need a transplant in that patient. There are a lot of technicalities around that. If they get their normal B cells back, which suggests that their CAR T cells aren't there anymore and that happens before six months, we can recommend a transplant or we can give more CAR T cells. In patients who are MLL rearranged, there's a concern about lineage switch and a lot of arguments about whether you go to transplant or not in that group of patients. Now, FDA approved uh, and also approved in the UK, in the EU, Canada, Australia, Israel, Japan, um, all available. The only product is, is the uh, Tisogen Leclucel product, uh, which is uh, uh, for ALL. But both uh, Tisogen, Leclucel, um, uh, Yescarta, or Axicel, Ticardis, uh, I forget what their uh, generic name is, um, are available for various kinds of lymphoma. Um, those are the, those are the, the indica four indications, three cell therapies that are FDA approved in the United States and uh, uh, soon to be in the world. And this is just a picture on the right of our uh, patient who we treated eight years ago who remains in remission without further therapy, including the transplant that they came to us for but decided not to get. Indications up to age 25. We, on clinical trials, will treat patients up to 29, but for a commercial product, it's an absolute limitation, 25 or younger, period. The uh, drug company makes the cell product for the individual patient, and they know how old the patient is. So there's no 26 off-label, but you can treat a 26-year-old on one of our clinical trials, no problem. Uh, we can definitely do that. And again, up to 29 is what CHOP allows us. They need to be in uh, second relapse or be refractory. And they do not need to be in remission. We don't need a bone marrow donor. And there's some circumstances where we need to get them in better shape, especially bad infection, before we can treat them. This is just uh, a concluding slide now. Um, this is not my slide, I found it on the web, but just showing all the companies and, and, and uh, other entities, including uh, universities that are working on a variety of different CAR-T products. I mean, this is insane. Um, we have the two and now three marketed products in the United States. We have two marketed products uh, 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 in multiple place, places abroad. We have two other products that are very close to FDA approval, should be in the next few months. And then just to a mad proliferation of different shots on goal because so much money is being spent on this. A lot of these are gonna be a bust or just Me Too products, but some of them are gonna be the amazing car tees of the future. And Scott Gottlieb, the former commissioner of the FDA said by 2025, he's expecting um, 20 to 25 actually, uh, uh, gene modified and car T products uh, to be presented to the Food and Drug Administration for approval. So this is just moving like crazy want to end by acknowledging uh, the folks that uh, I had the, have had the um, privilege of working with, especially Carl June and Bruce Levine at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, um, uh, and then uh, the cell therapy group at CHOP, the clinical um, group at, uh, at CHOP, uh, Shannon Maud, Richard Aplens, Susan, Sue Reingold, multiple folks, uh, all the study staff. You cannot believe the paperwork that's involved in all this stuff. 
Uh, but the, the study staff at Chop are unbelievable. Our, our NPs are the greatest uh, clinical colleagues we could possibly work with. Um, other folks at Chop who are um, instrumentals, uh, apheresis, and especially the PICU for when our patients do get sick. And then, of course, the patients and families. And I know that we're going to move on to Richard's talk, uh, and then both he and I can take questions at the end. So I hope I, all I see is my slides. I hope you guys have been um, putting questions in, and please don't hesitate to keep doing so. And we do have time at the end to answer any questions that you may have, including stuff that I zipped over and you want more information on. And again, be happy to make these slides available. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Steve. Um, maybe we'll now move to uh, my presentation on AML. Let me uh, work on sharing my screen and hopefully um, that will go smoothly. All right, uh, hopefully everybody can um, uh, see my slides. All right, start here at the You're top. Good. See you. Great. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of background about pediatric AML. You're certainly very familiar with uh, ALL from Steve's presentation. And I think the, the key take home points are that there are about 500 children in the US who will be diagnosed this year. and about two thirds of them will survive that diagnosis and there'll be close to 20,000 adult and pediatric cases um, uh, in the US. Um, and of the adults, only about a third will survive. So there's uh, a great deal of heterogeneity in AML, both within uh, the pediatric and between the adult and pedi uh, pediatric populations, which you obviously can see in the survival curve or the survival estimates. Um, and that variation is both in terms of mutational uh, burden, which really is lower in pediatrics than adults, and, and substantially more structural variance in younger children than in adults. Despite that, there are actually multiple shared cell surface targets, with uh, 33 and 123 uh, being the most commonly targeted. So AML therapy is very intensive and, and unlike the immunotherapy that Steve is describing, it's actually primarily inpatient. I um, mean, it's actually the most intensive therapy I think you can give to a child outside of an allergenic donor stem cell transplant. Um, and, you know, typically we give uh, two courses of induction chemotherapy and then about a third of patients go on to get transplant in first remission. And again, despite this, about half of the patients Will, will actually relapse. This is a slide for the pediatric oncologist on the slide um, on the talk, uh, just showing the relative dose intensities between the different cooperative groups that are developing protocols for children with AML. And you can see that these are actually very, very high uh, chemotherapy doses and given over a relatively a short period of time. So I, as you can imagine, children who have relapsed or refractory AML uh, do even worse than children uh, who have uh, been diagnosed and treated for the first time. And as a point of definition, refractory AML is an AML that doesn't achieve remission after two cycles of treatment. And you know, within this, actually, the time to relapse is the biggest determinant of response for these children. So the shorter time uh, between initial diagnosis and relapse uh, the greater the probability that the child actually can't uh, be salvaged from that relapse. Now, it's important to note there are some patients who have AML that have favorable molecular features and uh, have an extended time to relapse, and those, those patients can be treated uh, fairly effectively with therapies available today, but those are very much of a, a minority of patients, and, and it's important, again, to emphasize here that transplant is really thought to be required for cure uh, in this in the relapsed and refractory setting. These are just two graphs from two manuscripts uh, describing the experience in the United States of patients with relapsed AML. And the figure on your left uh, is a, a legacy CCG trial that really provided for the first time information about the 
impact of time to relapse and overall outcome. And you can see that patients who you know, relapsed um, less than a year post their initial diagnosis there had a, a, a overall survival of less than 25%. And uh, there's more recent data on the right, uh, again, uh, showing uh, overall survival in the 30% range for all children with AML who had relapsed. So uh, clearly there's a very substantial need for new therapies uh, within this patient population. So, you know, Steve showed how remarkable uh, uh, CAR therapy has been in transforming the pediatric ALL uh, landscape. Um, and, you know, that has uh, created a lot of excitement at Penn and CHOP and many other centers for CAR therapy for AML. But there are some additional complexities to CAR therapy and AML. Uh, the first one is that, you know, all of the currently known target antigens on AML leukemia cells are, are really also seen on normal hematopoietic progenitors. Um, and so it's thought generally that a durable response against AML blasts would have a very high chance of causing bone marrow aplasia, which is, as you know, is a life-threatening complication. And, and thus, uh, uh, unlike actually the ALL experience that Steve highlighted and pioneered, um, transplant is actually very likely to be required after AML CAR therapy. Now, uh, as of this morning, I think there were 28 AML CAR trials listed on clinicaltrials.gov. And there was a wide range of, of targets with I think 33 and, and 123 uh, being the most common. Uh, there are 22 trials that include children um, and they're present uh, at several US sites, um, which are listed here. I wanted to talk very briefly about the CHOP AML CAR pipeline and, and to talk uh, in a little bit of detail about one of the trials, the CD33 trial, which I think will be uh, emblematic in, in terms of eligibility and exclusion criteria for the other trials. So the 33 trial is currently open now. Uh, we hope to open the 123 trial in February. We actually have IRB approval and are just working through the administrative components of it. Um, and then there's a, a CD38 trial that we're doing jointly with Penn that has a targeted opening in quarter three of, of next year for adult patients with pediatric patients, hopefully to follow shortly afterwards. So the 33 uh, CAR construct was developed by Terry Fry. It uses the traditional NIH uh, um, CAR construct. Uh, Seritasian at CHOP did much of the preclinical testing. Uh, the vector was manufactured here at CHOP and the CVC. And this is a multi-site trial um, with CHOP and the National Cancer Institute as initial sites um, and uh, four other sites which are listed here that are in the process of opening and hopefully will be enrolling patients in that in the next several months. This lists the study sponsors, and since this is a multi-site trial, we partnered with the NMDP uh, to be the IND sponsor, and, and that was uh, approved in June of uh, last year. Manufacturing is done uh, by BDP at the Frederick uh, National Laboratory. Um, so, uh, this is a, a manufacturing on the Progeny system. And the IBMTR uh, functions as the, the CRO, managing safety monitoring and study operations. And then uh, there are a series of laboratories that are doing research uh, sample testing. So this is, as you would imagine, a standard uh, phase one uh, study with actually a phase two expansion cohort with potentially uh, 34 patients uh, receiving uh, infusion over a 36 month period. Uh, with, uh, as you would expect, standard uh, follow-up durations. This is the study flow uh, for, for the trial. Um, hopefully you can see my arrow uh, or pointer. A couple points that I would make is that the study does actually allow apheresis to occur prior to enrollment, so it is possible to use a um, historically collected apheresis product. Uh, our timeline uh, from enrollment to infusion, we're targeting six weeks, um, and uh, investigators can use uh, 
standard of care chemotherapy to bridge in that time if needed. Uh, manufacturing takes uh, 10 to 14 days, uh, and uh, we uh, give a standard Udarabine and cytoxin uh, lymphodepletion uh, prior to infusion. Uh, there is a standard, uh, you know, dose escalation, which is uh, listed here, and I think uh, in greater uh, detail here, so maybe a little bit easier to read. Uh, we uh, started at dose level one. We are um, now treating our third patient on that dose level, and are hopeful that we will be able to escalate to dose level two as the therapy has been uh, well tolerated in the first uh, two patients. This is our dose escalation plan. I think what's important to note here is that uh, in the first cohort, uh, the first three patients had to be uh, greater than 16 years of age. Um, and uh, once uh, we finish uh, the first three patients at dose level one, then uh, we need to enroll another patient greater than 16 at dose level two, but then after that will be uh, open uh, for younger pediatric patients. The study objectives, as you can imagine, uh, first of all, are to de determine the, the, the MTD of this uh, lentil, lentivirally transduced CAR product. Uh, and then we are looking at a secondary uh, endpoint in the phase two portion of the study to look at uh, morphologic remission uh, at day 28 post uh, infusion. There are obviously a series of many secondary, uh, both uh, clinical and uh, biologic uh, correlative studies, but I um, will have not included those in the interests of uh, time. So very quickly, uh, in terms of inclusion criteria, uh, patients must have CD33 positive AML either by uh, flow, cytometry, flow cytometry or immunohistochemistry in second or greater relapse or uh, uh, relapse after transplant. Um, the uh, patients do need to have a detectable disease, but uh, at actually a fairly low level uh, if that is uh, post-transplant, uh, less than 0.1%. Uh, um, uh, here are the 33 expression uh, criteria, um, and then age is between uh, 1 and uh, 35 years of age, um, so we have a fairly broad uh, age uh, criteria for this trial. Um, and uh, patients must have an identified allogeneic donor, uh, and, and they must uh, have the capability at the center or at a partnering referral center to take the patient to transplant within six to eight weeks of the uh, infusion. And patients need a performance score of greater than 10%. Uh, patients obviously must be able to give consent um, and also enroll in the NMDP uh, protocol, uh, to, uh, which is the, the research database for uh, cellular therapies. Patients must have uh, adequate end organ function as defined here. These are, uh, I think, standard and, and would not be uh, unexpected for any uh, phase one trial. The exclusion criteria really focus on radiologically determined CNS disease or CNS3 disease. Patients who have had uh, radiologically detected chromas or CNS3, CNS3 disease are eligible uh, once their CNS leukemia has been treated. Patients with rapidly progressive disease are not eligible. Um, and uh, there are some uh, exclusion criteria post the first transplant. Of note, patients who have had two transplants would not be eligible at this time. Uh, and treatment with any prior CAR therapy product uh, is, is also an exclusion criteria. There are some additional systemic chemotherapy uh, criteria which are listed here, which I won't read, but which are available to you in the slide deck. And as you might expect, uh, patients who are pregnant or HIV positive or have uncontrolled bacterial, viral, or fungal infections are not uh, eligible, um, as well as you know patients who have who have a condition that would really limit compliance with the study requirements. I would like to 
provide just a little bit of information about the CD123 CAR trial. This is a construct that was developed by Sargill at Penn um, with pediatric testing by Seratasian. Uh, again, vector manufactured here at CHOP. There have been 12 adults uh, treated and a safe uh, infusion dose and schedule has been defined. The cell manufacturing happens at Penn uh, as opposed to the NIH for the 33 trial. And as I said, we're uh, scheduled to open this in February of next year. And importantly, CD123 expression is, is not an eligibility criteria. There's enough variability in the flow antibodies uh, related to 123 that, that this is actually not uh, an, ex uh, an eligibility criteria. And uh, finally, I'll close a little bit with information about the 38 trial. This is a construct that was developed uh, cooperatively by my group with SARS group with preclinical testing done in AML by Sarah and, and TALL by Dave Tichy. Uh, this will actually have in children a uh, AML and ALL stratum, uh, and in adults um, we'll have uh, uh, both uh, AML and multiple myeloma uh, stratum as this is, uh, you know, CD38 is present uh, on the cell surface of, of all of those uh, malignancies. So this is a pan-heme uh, hematologic malignancy uh, CAR. Um, so, uh, thank you. Uh, I think that's all the slides that I have, and I'll uh, stop sharing my screen, and, and we can certainly take uh, any questions uh, if there are any. Thanks so much, Dr. Grupp and Aplenz. Those were two great presentations. I'm looking forward to learning more during the Q&A. Um, my name is Kate Jerome. I'm the program coordinator for the cell therapy and transplant section here at CHOP, and I will be monitoring your questions. So be sure to Submit them by using the Q&A button that you can see right here in the portal, and then I will be passing those along. All right, so we will start with, should we be incorporating apheresis or cell storage into upfront treatment schedules for mm -hmm. high-risk ALL cases in case CAR is indicated, excuse me, at a later stage? So, uh, I'll, I'll take that because I made a point about pheresis in the um, talk that I gave. Um, that's a great, great idea and a great question. And I think that at, in ALL, uh, I, I'm going to turn this over to Richard for for what he thinks about AML. But uh, in ALL, where we really understand what the rules are to get on to CAR T therapy, I, the sooner you collect T cells, the better. Uh, the less chemo the T cells see, the better. And there are some chemos like clofarabine that I mentioned that really make it hard to collect T cells afterwards. And so my sense is that if you really feel like there's a, a reasonable chance, and you know, early on when we were talking about this to our leukemia group, we were thinking like a 50-50 chance that the patient might go on to a CAR T cell therapy, then I think it's worth getting them in for collection. Uh, we we do that as a as a uh, on a clinical basis. It's not linked to a protocol. It's not a research procedure. We just collect the cells. We freeze and store them to prepare uh, to preserve the option for cell therapy. Um, now, up front, let's talk about that in two different ways. So first off, uh, we know that it's hard to make CAR T cells on babies, kids who are under uh, three or especially under two. And we know that the more chemo we give the babies, the harder it is to actually have the cells grow successfully. So there's been a lot of discussion about collecting T cells literally up front on uh, infant ALL. But uh, of course, these are also infants and, the, and they're often sort of sick and therefore the feasibility of doing that is very much in question. But in theory, if you could magic the cells out and then proceed with induction chemotherapy, that would definitely preserve uh, the option of cell therapy. And then the other situation, so high-risk ALL, um, the, uh, where uh, patients are MRD uh, positive after two cycles of chemotherapy, that is the subject of a COG trial that Shannon Maud and Steve Hunger wrote with uh, the folks at Novartis, and Shannon runs the International Study Steering Committee for. And so uh, they're, they're collecting the cells after it's clear that they might be heading toward cell therapy on that trial. And that's a true upfront cell therapy question that's being asked in that protocol. So I think it's a fantastic question. And Richard, um, have you been operationalizing or thinking about operationalizing collection in your AML patients, which of course, as you point about the intensity of therapy is even potentially a little bit more challenging. 
It's a great question, and I think it's in AML it's made even more complicated by the fact that we don't have uh, in children yet the remarkable efficacy data that has been shown with the 19 uh, products. Um, and so it, um, I think it in general makes it more challenging to collect before someone, you know, uh, clearly it's very likely to um, meet the eligibility criteria. Um, but there are some uh, molecular uh, fusions that are associated with such poor prognosis that for the right family um, who could understand with whom you know, we could have you know, the complicated nuanced discussions that we need to have and an assurance that we actually would um, be able to have a manufacturing slot for a patient. I think there are some patients where we might uh, collect them before they actually had relapsed um, because their chances of relapse would be so high. I'm thinking of, you know, the CBF bliss, uh, you know, fusions and and a couple other mutations that are associated with really poor prognosis. And you know, our hope is that um, you know we'll have efficacy that you know is 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 substantive. And then I think we'll really benefit from the you know ALL experience that that I think really changed you know many of our thinking about a risk tolerance for collecting and collecting outside of a context of a protocol. Um, you know, our thinking has shifted. Uh, I think at least my thinking has shifted very substantively on those issues over time as we've seen the remarkable efficacy of the, you know, CAR-19 directed therapy. All right, the next question is, what will it take, in your opinion, to make CART the first-line therapy for newly diagnosed ALL? So, Dr. Grubb, I'll give this one to you. All right. So, um, I think we're as close to that as we're ever going to get is the real answer. So, if a patient is uh, diagnosed with ALL um, and uh, is referred to the emergency room or an oncologist, um, we're never going to – the first thing that patient get is never going to be RT because we saw the connection between um, high disease burden and toxicity, and it is so easy to uh, d uh, reduce the disease in an ALL patient that there's really, uh, I, I think, even if um, CAR T worked 100% of the time, you'd still give them some initial induction chemotherapy followed by LD chemotherapy in a future where we uh, go for uh, CAR T that early. But uh, as I mentioned, there's the COG trial, Children's Oncology Group trial, where, and I hope you're thinking about this trial for patients of yours who have high-risk ALL and maintain MRD positivity. But for those patients, um, they'll get induction, they'll get consolidation. If still MRD positive, they'll uh, get CAR-T therapy after a short bridging period. And those patients could end up with four months of chemo followed by CAR-T and We'll see what happens. This is a clinical trial. We don't know how well this is going to work. But our goals are maintain remission, stay away from transplant, and, oh, by the way, if this works, those kids only saw four months of chemo. And so that that's an exciting idea. It's a big stretch, but uh, that trial is accruing well. And the one thing I know for sure is we'll have some kind of answer. All right. On the video shown by Dr. Grubb, what happened to the CAR T cell after it killed the lymphoblast? <laughs> that's that's a fabulous question because it really gets to the bumblebee question. Do T cells kill once and, and die or do they uh, kill multiple cells, which Carl June uh, uh, un-euphoniously likes to refer to as serial killers? And so I think there's a reasonable amount of data that a, a CAR T cell can hop from cell to cell to cell and kill at least a handful of cells. I don't think it goes on forever. I think you run out of perforin. I think the cell is 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 not, uh, you know, the cell is also uh, proliferating and the cells that proliferate from it have an opportunity to kill. So I think the power in this is whether or not the CAR T cell kills one cell or three or four cells, the key thing is the CAR T cell gives rise to 1,000 or 10,000 cells, and that's where the amplification takes place, and we're actually able to uh, ki uh, kill uh, even, uh, you know, literally kilograms of uh, uh, leukemia in some patients. So uh, it's a great question. I think there's limited serial killing, 
but eventually the key is proliferation and the best functional CAR T in the world, if it doesn't divide, is not gonna get a patient into remission. So that's a fabulous question. Wonderful. And then how is what we are hearing talked about tonight, how does that fit in with what we hear about off the shelf CAR T cells? So um, I wanna get Richard's uh, take on this, but so, the, the idea here, and it, it's, it's happening in clinical trials, the idea here is rather than going through all the work that it takes, and it's a lot of work, you would only do this if it works as well as it does, to collect T cells on each individual patient, to manufacture T cells on each individual patient, to do the full release testing. There's obviously a cost associated with all those things. So what's the, ch what's the choice here? What else could we do? Well, we could cr take T cells from a donor, which is completely unrelated, um, to the uh, patient. We can collect those T cells. We can knock out the T cell receptor genetically, uh, and that's very possible in this kind of manufacturing setting. You can do it with, with various gene editing techniques, CRISPR, um, talons, there are a variety of approaches that you can just delete the whole uh, locus and not have a T cell receptor. Now you have a T cell that won't cause graft versus host disease, and you could give to a completely unrelated person who has no HLA match whatsoever. And remember, the cars themselves are not HLA dependent, so that doesn't matter. And so this idea of off the shelf is you create, you collect cells from a single donor, you uh, qualify a mass of cells that could treat 20 or 30 or even more patients. I've, I've heard drug companies talk about hundreds of patients. I've not seen data that suggests that that's actually what's gonna happen. But it is still 20 or 30 is way better than one if it's equally functional. And I, I, you know, I do see, uh, Richard, that this is also coming to, I mean, obviously it took a long time to go from autologous to allogeneic in the ALL world, but now I'm seeing that coming down the pike for AML. Do you, do you have any perspective on that? I think very similar to what you're saying. I mean, there are, are um, you know, the UCAR-123 um, from Selectus, you know, that we have treated a patient with here um, and you know is in trials and and certainly you know it's um, you know, if the efficacy was comparable it would be very helpful because then you wouldn't be dependent on the patient's lymphocyte count and we certainly have had you know patients where we have not been able to get an adequate phoresis product and then you know not able to move forward um, or where we've been able to get a phoresis product, and the, but the product is, you know, is 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 one that's been very heavily pretreated, and then you, you know, worry about how those cells are actually going to do in manufacture. Um, and in AML, you know, you may end up actually, you know, if you're phoresing while you're, you know, in a, a blast state. This happened to us in our, you know, one of our patients. You you get a mix of AML cells and, you know, your T cells while you're doing the, you know, the cell manufacture and so in, in those situations, it would be helpful um, to have, uh, you know, an allogeneic product, to, assuming it worked as effectively as the autologous products that we have. And I think for me, that's sort of the, you know, open question um, because I, you know, my take on at least my understanding of the allogeneic, you know, 19 directed experience is that it doesn't seem to be as um, as robust, at least as what we've seen with you know, the, the pen of artists, you know, product. So I think that would be my perspective. All right. You talked about reinfusion of CAR T cells in cases with early B cell recovery. Are there any other times you would consider using reinfusion or retreatment? So um, reinfusion. That's, that's an area where we have done a lot of work and done uh, very little publicing, uh, publication on. So that's, that data should be coming out in the next few months, I hope. And um, so what are the situations in which we consider reinfusion? So if we have a patient who does not initially respond to their CAR-T in that five to 18% of patients who don't respond, depending on the study, um, that if that patient doesn't respond, is still CD19 positive, the likelihood of getting a response from a second infusion is in our, we haven't done it a bunch of times, but we've never seen it work, so we don't do that. Um, it may be that people will study this and find a way to make it happen. The one exception to that is if you think 
that the T cells are being shut off, you could consider using a checkpoint inhibitor. And we have done that and have seen at least partial responses under that circumstance. Um, not sure that that's been a path to long-term disease control in anybody quite yet. So that's typically we don't retreat unless we can add something to make it work better. And a checkpoint inhibitor would be something that would make it work better. Obviously, B cell uh, recovery indicates CAR T cell loss. Uh, we often retreat for that either with the same product or with a uh, version 2.0 product, which is basically the same CAR but humanized, so there's less chance of an immune reaction to it. So that's an indication. Patients who relapse, uh, and as opposed to never go into remission at all, if they relapse with CD19 positive disease, then we're happy to retreat them as well. But at that point, if they get back into remission, we're going to recommend a transplant because the CAR didn't do it for them for the first time. But sometimes we get a patient who relapses after a CD19 CAR. We put them on the humanized trial. We see long-term B-cell aplasia. And those patients, we're not going to transplant if that's what the family is comfortable with. We'll just see what happens. So there are a variety of circumstances under which we would consider this. And then beyond six months or so, if you get your, your uh, B cells back, uh, we, we try to do nothing about that. It, it, it does cause a lot of, of anxiety. People like years of persistence, even though it also is associated with a need for IVIG. They like that. Every single patient family that I've talked to who is five, six, seven, eight years out, where I've said, hey, if we had something to give you, I could give you a pill and get rid of these CAR T cells and go back to not needing uh, IVIG or uh, subcutaneous IVIG, which is what we do with these patients. Would you let me give your daughter or son that pill? And the consensus is almost universally, I would tackle you and drag you out of the room before you did that. So uh, people don't seem to think that that's something that they want, at least right now. But, you know, you, I got kids in college who are uh, have, uh, still have B-cell aplasia at some point. This is uh, an issue that we're going to have to deal with. Not everybody lasts that long, but a reasonable fraction of them do. All right, so there's a few questions surrounding um, a lower threshold of disease to target prior to infusion. Um, do you have a strict definition for when you would not proceed to CAR or when you would kind of try to hold off on infusion until they reach that level? Great question. So here's the thing. Um, the only reason we wouldn't treat somebody is if we gave them lymphodepleting chemotherapy, fludarabine and cytoxan, and their disease was exponentially increasing, 10, 20, 40, 60,000 white cells um, uh, blasts, we, 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 might, we would think that that wouldn't be safe. And in one or two instances, we haven't treated patients like that. If they have 100% blasts in their marrow, and that's measured after LD chemo and the day before T-cell infusion, we will treat that patient without hesitation. Just did it today. So we'll absolutely do that. There's a higher risk of CRS. But here's what it boils down to in terms of thinking about chemotherapy. Either the patients are refractory or they aren't. And if they're not refractory, then uh, intermediate dose IV chemo will keep the lid on the disease very nicely, and we're delighted with that. If they are refractory, the, their safest path, even though that's not ideal and higher toxicity for sure, their safest path is to uh, get to CAR-T as quick as they can and not have a lot of high-dose chemotherapy trying to get them down to, you know, from 90 to 50 percent or something like that. That doesn't seem to make much difference. If I identified a sweet spot, I mean, MRD negative is great. MRD positive is great. Anything up to like 10, 20 percent blasts, no problem. Anywhere in there is certainly the easiest experience from a patient standpoint. All right. You suggested that defining a CD19 negative population at relapse is not always straightforward. Do you have a strict definition for when you would not proceed to CAR in that case? Uh, I don't. Uh, we don't. Um, we struggle. So first off, percentages on a pathologist report are of no use whatsoever. I mean, Richard talked about CD123 antibodies not being very good. CD19 antibodies are awesome, but you can have dim, it works. You can have um, uh, apparently a gradient from bright to negative, and you don't know if the negatives are really negative, and you treat them and they go into remission. So what you really need is a prior history of CD19-directed therapy and two-dimensional dot plots that clearly shows two separate populations, or really an obvious completely negative population where they were completely positive before. And that takes 
seeing the dot plots. Uh, the pathologist report doesn't help you with that. And I think there are a lot of centers who aren't sweating that issue. Uh, but if you are going to sweat that issue, that's probably what you have to do uh, is, is to see it at, at that level. And there's no, it's, it's one of those, I know it when I see it kind of things, not I, any of us who uh, bring in patients, we know it when we see it. Uh, and not that we can say, okay, if the, the CD19 number is below 86%, don't treat them. We're not saying that at all. It's really the, char the true flow characteristics of the cell. And we argue endlessly about this. So it's, it's, I have to admit, that's, that's uh, uh, absolutely true. I, I want to, in all fairness, jump into the question about what does this cost? It, uh, uh, Kim Raya in the United States costs $475,000. Um, if you do retreat and there are bags available, those are free. Um, uh, the uh, drug company will provide uh, 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 cells for patients who don't, um, whose insurance don't cover this on their assistance plan. And uh, there is a outcomes-based agreement with the company where if, you, if your institution has this signed, they will not charge for the product if, you, if your patient does not go into remission by day 35, I believe is the number. Um, so uh, it, is, it is expensive. It's not as expensive as the newer gene therapies, were in the, which are in the millions, making the, the amazement around $475,000 somewhat uh, quaint. Um, but uh, for the patients that can avoid a transplant and have long-term benefit in that 40 to 50 percent group of patients, I think there's a real value proposition from my perspective. Um, and we haven't done a, a pharmacoeconomic analysis, but I'm sure that's coming at some point. Okay, so going off that cost question, these are kind of this is kind of a bigger bigger picture question for both of you. Do you have thoughts on where that may go as the therapy expands to more targets? Cost? Um, boy, great question. Um, I don't know. Uh, I I think that, I mean. We were talking about this at a um, advisory board for a, a different cell therapy company where they're looking at a much larger indication in solid tumors. And how does this work in, in um, uh, a disease where there are tens of thousands of potential patients to be treated every year? Um, how do you actually manufacture that many cells? Um, and what would that mean in terms of uh, costs and, 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 and both costs and savings. I mean, I think that, that as, as this becomes outside of hematologic malignancies, and there's a big roadblock in solid tumors, we're not there yet by any means, but that, you know, if this stuff worked for lung cancer, um, then, you know, that's over 100,000 people a year, well over, and, you know, what, what, what kind of situation are we in then? Um, so I think that there's a lot of discussion about how to price these expensive, hopefully one and done type therapies across both the cancer and non-cancer realms. Um, and I think uh, some way to sort of spread these costs over time and only pay if there's benefit to the patient is probably the model that we'll be heading to. But that's going to be easier to implement in, I don't want to get into the whole insurance thing, but much easier to implement in single uh, payer systems than they will be in the United States. All right. Um, speaking of insurance, we got a question for how is insurance coverage navigated for harvest pre-relapse ALL outside of trial? So uh, I think there are two answers to that question. Now, at CHOP, uh, I was able to secure funding for this. Um, so we pay for the apheresis and we pay for the stem cell lab processing. Um, we, the central line is still placed like clinical um, for uh, under clinical things. And definitely, there's a, I think there, there are two ways that you can approach this, and it's very dependent on your, your insurers, but there are two ways to approach this. One is that in a clinical trial setting, um, the argument is that costs uh, that are uh, part of the routine care of patients related to the clinical trial, but not, for instance, the cells themselves, uh, that those should be reimbursable from an insurance point of view. And that has been our experience and maybe are, I mean, we get patients from all over the country, so we're seeing all these insurers and all these Medicaids from different states, and my dear friend Claire White deals with this all the time. So, I mean, that's one approach. The other approach is now that there's an FDA-approved cell therapy, uh, just collect uh, because there's, that's now a 
that, that is a FDA approved cell therapy for patients and you're collecting cells to be able to do that therapy. And in that situation, although we don't do it that way because we haven't had to, I would see this the same as collecting peripheral blood stem cells for an autologous transplant. You can't do the transplant without the cells. You can't do cell therapy without the cells. And uh, hopefully, uh, and I know that people do this, uh, and I guess insurers differ for sure, but hopefully just saying this is a now a standard procedure because Kim Raya is FDA approved is may, pro may be the easiest way to go. All right, of those patients who lose B cell aplasia, how many stay in remission without further therapy? Yeah, Stefan, that's a great question. And the answer is uh, there are hardly any of those patients. So it really seems like there's a group of patients that lose their B cell aplasia fairly quickly. And those are the reinfusion patients. And uh, th uh, that might be 20% of the patients or so. And then there's a group of patients who uh, keep their B cell aplasia for years. And the people in the middle are what you're looking at, you know, people who are a year or two out lose their B-cell aplasia and remain in remission. That's a small handful of patients. There are people who do remain in remission. We don't find that the CD19 positive relapse rate um, is a problem out past, let's say, six to 12 months. That's where the six months comes from. And, but it's such a small number of patients that I don't have confidence in that data. It's a thing, it happens, but um, I couldn't tell you what the stats look like because it's not enough to analyze. It looks like that's uh, our, our last question and we're up on time. Thank you so much for uh, today's lecture. Uh, just as a reminder for everyone, we will be sharing a copy of the recording and everyone will get a email with some information uh, for feedback survey as well as where you can claim your CME. All right, well, thank you very much.